Yeah. So, uh, she's going to be talking about strength on the path. And I think that's one of the things that we've been talking about right now this morning is that strength that we need on this path because sometimes things don't happen the way we thought they were going to or we were them what we thought we wanted. And then things change. And it's amazing that God seems to know what's best. That mother, father, God energy, even though we're fighting and saying, no, this can't be best, this can't be best. And then you turn around 10, 15, 20 years later and go, that really was the best that could have happened. So Carolyn, we know that the best is there, that God is totally, truly holding you in the hands of God. And so as Mary goes on with telling us about how we can stay, get on the path, stay on the path, and accept that the path is truly the way, please welcome Reverend Mary. Yeah. She says the choir singing that. <laughs> Bribery is good thing. <laughs> yes, it is. Alive and well. Alive and well. Well, because I'm always alive and well when the choir is here. It's just mm -hmm. something happens in my heart. And one of the things I was going to talk about is how everyone has a soul. And I think everybody who's here believes they have a soul. And Two sources that I'm going to, to talk from today talk about, define the soul as a spark from mm -hmm. God. And um, I'm looking up at their no uh, stoles. Mm -hmm. I haven't been here in a while, so they may not be quite as new to you as they were to me, but <laughs> I see all those little sparks of God right on their stoles. And I said, yeah, this is supposed to be. Me too, I hate to be hungry. Okay. So my path for the past few days has been to sort papers. You know, we, we are moving eternally into our new home. And um, I had 20-some boxes of papers. Oh. Yeah, you know, no wonder God had to procrastinator. I, I, I think it was the work of the devil, but I don't believe in the devil, so I think <laughs> But, you know, here are all these papers from all these years, boxes of them from North Carolina, boxes of them from the, sh the uh, cave in the other house in California, boxes of papers that I can no longer avoid. And so I said, okay, you know, quit your whimpering, put your jeans and your dirty t-shirt on and sit down and go through those papers. And I did. Wow. And, Bravo, Mary. <laughs> well, thanks. I don't th I'm not sure somebody who has procrastinated for all the years I've procrastinated on those papers should be rewarded. <laughs> <laughs> but, it is definitely God, rewarded. Uh, God did give me a reward. Um, a lot of you have known me for a long time, and a lot of you probably not so long. But um, I came resistantly into metaphysics. Uh, what happened to me is that, you know, first of all, I, um, I'm a scrappy broad. You know, I was a tough, scrappy broad growing up. We didn't have a lot of money. You either took care of yourself or you had to put up with a lot of stuff I had no intention of putting up with. And so I started out early as a scrappy broad. And, um, and I, I kind of was blessed with a, a supportive enough home so that I turned it into scrapping for the good guys, you know, as opposed to just scrapping. Besides the last time I had a fight and got infected in my hand, I said, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> so I, I was on a, a uh, probably a humanist path, you would call it, but not a spiritual path when I met Tom. And uh, you, you've all heard the story. I was sitting in a bar. Yahoo! It was, it was my... Uh, you know, I have one night out a week because I was divorced and so I had somebody taking care of my children and I traded. So one night I'd have Friday night and then the next night she'd have, not, next time she'd have Saturday night we'd switch taking care of kids. I don't know why I told you that. 
unnecessary information. Oh no, it's always <laughs> it's an insight into right. right so. <laughs> <laughs> so the door opened and I looked over my shoulder, my left shoulder, because I remember it so vividly. And this man walked in the door, and the voice inside me said, "It's him. Mm -hmm. He's come. It's him." And I thought, "This is Irish. I'll never quit." So we met that night, and we and it was wonderful. And I thought, "Oh gosh, I can't wait to see him again." So I wrote my phone number everywhere I could think. Well, the place is on the sleeve of his shirt. <laughs> I said, no, you know, nothing, nothing. He didn't call, he didn't anything. And so, but then we ran into each other again, we ran into each other again, and I realized he'd just come from a painful relationship. He wasn't looking for another relationship. And I'd uh, been far enough away from my painful relationship that I decided I was just fine without a relationship. I didn't want to, you know, but anyway. But we, you know the story. We've been married now for 44 years. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, I, as I got to know him, his spirituality was inherent. I mean, it was just inherent. I'm sorry he's not here now because you could just look at him and know it's yeah. inherent. Yeah. Yes. You know, he, he's just an incredibly centered spiritual man who believes you have to manifest that, otherwise people won't believe it can happen. And so he does, and did. And I called my mama and I said, Mama, I don't think I can be involved in anybody quite this good. <laughs> she said, it's fine, Mary Elizabeth, it's fine. She said, why don't I keep the children and you two go away for a weekend? So we did and we went to Tahoe for a friend's wedding and I laughed all the way up there. So I said, oh, okay, he's a really good guy with a sense of humor, I can do this. But I still, you know, the stuff he talked about, healing, spirits, you know, I, I, it was just really hard for me, it was really hard for me. And so one night, this is, you know, well, it was before we were married, so it was, no it was not, I was married to him and I married him, I went through the whole thing, I remember crying the day of our wedding, sitting on the couch saying, dear God, don't let me make a mistake, you know, I have two children I'm responsible for, I cannot make a mistake, it feels so right, but I'm so scared. And, um, but it was right, and it continued to be right. But it was still, he had this piece of himself, and I was over here. I was a good person, but I was not a spiritual person. And I certainly didn't expect to have any chat with any spirits anytime soon. And so one day I said, what is all this stuff you guys all talk about? If there's some spirits out there, I'd like one of those messages. Be careful what you ask for. I found, going through the boxes, the first message I ever had. Oh, that's awesome. And it is so darn good that I'm going to read it to you so that I can paraphrase it. So long. But it's good. This message said, The spark of God within the soul of man is sufficient unto itself to light the way of the soul to its God source. Truth, therefore, is found in all man's searching and is found in favor within <coughs> the eye of God. As man gather their light together to point it towards the heavens in their search for God, that gathered light brightens their path. Get on the path. This is before, I mean, I gave the topic well before I found this. Wow. That gathered light of your intentional searching brightens your path. And therefore, all gathered light brings pleasure to the eye of God. No person should attempt to put out the light of another soul, but should rather provide a safe harbor where a person can rest to dry their tinder, to rekindle their own light. That's what you do with a friend who thinks differently. 
but just needs a place to hold their life. Always remember to judge not another's truth. Seek always within yourself for your own truth. Challenge any seeker to stand to the light of the Christ consciousness. Not the master, not our Christian master, but the Christ consciousness, which is the highest, holiest manifestation in the world of what we're to try and become. Understand that while in the limitation of the human body, you will only have a piece of the truth. It is the seeking with a pure heart which is the answer, not the truth, which changes as the world changes. In the heart of humanity, not the mind of humanity, is the beacon home. So, I was impressed so far. So I said, well, I wonder if you can ask questions. So, of course, I asked. I said, how can the limited mind of a person find their way to God? And they snickered. They had a sense of humor with me even then. And said, if the small brain of a bird can know how to migrate safely, do you think not that a person would be given what was needed to find their way to God? Oh, wow. Whoa, oh. gives me chills now. <laughs> and then they went on and said, every person may not be ready to teach the word, but everyone can energize the power of the consciousness by thinking the word. Thinking the word. But by searching for the word, when searching for the truth, even within their own mind, that spark is energized. So you could just quietly, even in an ugly place, think about the truth and the path and the power of God and know that you're getting stronger. Visualize the spark in your mind, strengthened by thought, made brighter by word, and energized by commitment to action. Made brighter by word, and energized by commitment to action. Offering not only a beacon home, but a focus for those beacons of the beings, excuse me, of the light, that will help you on your journey. These beings of the light may work only through the light. And the stronger your light, the more you may receive from them. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what year that was? That? It was 1984. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> when men human travels toward God, the light becomes a path. When many people join to follow the path of one whose light is strong, great paths are made. Many people can more easily find their way when joining a path, but you must always be true to your own inner knowing. You may not remain upon a path because it is a path. And your heart will always know. Mm -hmm. Now how's that for a first message from Spirit? Mary, you want her I signed up? <laughs> you have a committee behind you. I mean you you this room behind you is such a crowd of yeah. spirits. Yeah. Yes. Right. It's well, you know why that is? That's because this room is full of light. Yes. We found someone in need, mm -hmm. and we adjusted what we were doing right. 
to care for the need. That's right. To say, what is our job here? Mm -hmm. Is our job here to follow our script? Or is our job here to reach our heart into a pain heart? Mm -hmm. Is that our job? That's our is job. Is that what we want to give to God when we get through? That's right. Say, well, I was really busy then, so I had some things I had to write down, but I'm sure whoever it was got by okay. <laughs> or do you want to say, I put that aside for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I took my aching heart into their aching heart. And I gave them a place of sanctity and safety for a few moments. That's what we can do for one another. That's it. That's all we can do. That's what we do. The other thing I was going to talk on, but I don't want to, to do too much. I don't want to go on. Maybe I'll, she'll invite me back and I'll talk on the rest of the book. <laughs> this is a book that my husband got for his 80th birthday. And unlike those early days, the minute I see something good now, I grab it. <laughs> <laughs> this blog is called Anna Bakara, The Book of Celtic Wisdom. And it is Anna, A-N-A-M, -A Kara, The Book of Celtic Wisdom. And it's, it's a wonderful book about love. About being in this world and understanding about love. It's um, the first thing it talks about. Well, first, let me tell you what Anna Kara is. Yes. yes. It is um, a definition of a relationship. Now, there are all kinds of relationships, there are acquaintances. I worry about us because of uh, social media. We are now have lots of acquaintances. Mm -hmm. How many times has somebody asked to befriend you and you thought, I don't know who this person is, and you look and they say, well, you know, they're a friend of Eileen's, they're a friend of Dottie's, they're a friend of B's, they're probably all right, sure. <laughs> uh, is that person my friend? No, that person is my acquaintance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or not even that much. Yeah. Well, really. That's true, kid. Might not be a, a person might be a toad, who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> Another toad. But then the next thing that happens is that you have relationships. Yeah. You have relationships with people where you share time, you share philosophy, you share things. But in this book, it says, no, no. Anamkara is a Celtic word for a soul bond. Yes. Oh. That is a soul bond, a friendship with beyond affection. A person who takes you lovingly aside and says, I really need to tell you, Mary, you need to get a grip, honey. You know, you are so, I so exhausted, not my fault, of course, but because you are being very irritable with people and it's painful. And I wouldn't be much of a friend if I didn't alert you to that's what's going on. That's a soul friend. Somebody who risks the person saying, well, I'm never irritable. How can you say that? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I ever do that. <laughs> but it's a person who takes some risk inside the relationship because they love you and they don't want you to go astray. Yeah, that's a soul friend. That's somebody who really wants you to have your place. And it says something that we all know. It doesn't say anything that we don't know exactly. Well, it said some things I didn't know, but it, a lot of it's what we talk about together is what we all already know. But sometimes we have to hear it just a little bit differently, and sometimes we have to be reminded of it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, because of the, the theory, the Celts are clanny people, you know. When the Irish came over, they all lived in Shantytown together. The thought of going out into the farmland and having a farm that was a hundred miles away from the next farm would be beyond thinking for a group of clanny Irishmen. You just have to all snuggle up together and fight it out. <laughs> so I'm not surprised that the Celtic book talks about the role of friendship and closeness in your life. And it says, but it won't do you any good to try and have loving acquaintances until you do the work that's necessary to love yourself. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. And in that spark within you is something you should think of as a wellspring. It, you were born with it. Everybody was born with it. Everybody has a capacity to love themselves 
and to love other people. We were born that way because God wants us to come home. Whoever God is, I'm sure God is changing as much as we're changing. We don't know God. We don't have to know. I, I don't know God. I have some ideas. He probably has had a snicker or two about some of them, but <laughs> I know that there's something more, and I know that I have a responsibility to live my life to get to it. And I trust more and more that I have an inherent wellspring that will help me to get there. And one of the things I was going to do, and I know I'm, I'm close to going over, but forgive me. No, do it. Um, one of the things I was going to do is to say, just take a little minute, right in your very own place, don't go to anybody else, don't think about it. Close your eyes and say, I'm going to imagine for a moment that I have a wellspring of love inside me. And I am going to give it permission to activate. And you know how when land is dry and parched, we certainly know that. And the a wellspring of water comes up and just gently moves out and softens that land and allows things to grow on it. If you consciously say to the wellspring of love in your heart, I give you permission to activate, then you will have an internal help with all of the external things that we use. So just take that second and we'll come back to this room. Say quietly within your own mind, if you choose, I give you permission to activate. Fill me with love from the inside that I may extend it to the outside. And that's what we ask for. We must work on our interior as much as we work on our exterior. Jan O'Donoghue said so. Mm -hmm. If there were more time, I would talk about our vision on the path, and perhaps that's another whole talk. But he talks about how we all know we have a third eye. And we think, you know, well, some people have their third eye open and they, can, they do wonderful things. Well, the fact is, whether you like it or not, your third eye is open all the time. It's just, and you look through it. You look through your eyes. Just so you don't stumble over the rocks, but you look through your eye to relate to the world. But you can build a cover on that eye so that you look through the eye, through the eye of fear, and then everything you see frightens you. Or you look through the eye with the eye of resentment, then everything is begrudged. Why is being prettier than I am? Why is, is Eileen smarter and more spiritual? Why is Dottie doing everything with a flair? Why, why, why? And so pretty soon, if there's no joy out there. There's just wing, wing, wing. So you have to clean that off your eye. And it doesn't all come easily. But if you the, the, the eye that I, I will take a minute to talk about because I was so impressed with it and I had never thought about it, is the indifferent eye. And I said, what does that mean, the indifferent eye? You don't care about people. I said, people who seek for and exercise power have to develop an indifferent eye. Hmm. And I said, what does that mean, an indifferent eye? It means that they have no compassion or linkage with the problems of people around them, particularly beneath them. They're the farmer who thinks that uh, they should be glad to work in the field with a short hoe in the sun without any water or restrooms, after all. After all what? Or in the South, the same nonsense that says, you know, what, where? They're, not really, they're not really like me. Therefore, I don't pay any attention to what hurts them. I don't put my arms around a woman who's in pain. Because uh, I don't have any compassion for that, and that that is they they are they produce a, a paradox when you look at them sometimes because they can have a mighty cause that they give money to that they've decided is worthy, 
or they can treat their family pretty well, or they can do a lot of things. But if they have developed, if we allow ourselves to develop an eye of indifference about any group, that allows us to act out of that less than mentality. This is they're less than me, so therefore I can treat them. Because, you know, I, I, I wondered for so long, how could people do that? How could you... How could you physically hurt someone and then think that was all fine? Well, because you've made them less than. And you could only do that if you develop an indifferent eye. So that's the one I really caution you about. And the way to counteract all that is to develop a loving eye. And this is a room full of loving eyes, if I ever saw it. There's more, but there'll be another day. And I want to thank you all for sharing your loving eyes with me. Thank well, you. I'm